Hey guys, this is part 2 of Cambridge IGCSC Physics Major 2020 Paper 23. The diagram shows a wave. What are the amplitude and the wavelength of this wave? Amplitude is the highest point of the wave from the center line, so it's 3 centimeters. Then wavelength is the length of one complete wave, so either like this or maybe like this. These are the wavelengths and in this diagram, it's this one, 8 centimeters. So 3 and 8, B is our answer. Question 22, which statement is correct? The speed of light in glass is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum multiplied by the refractive index of glass. Well, the formula is the refractive index of glass represented by n equals to the speed of light in a vacuum. I'll just put it as a divided by the speed of light in glass, b. So if you want to find the speed of light in glass, that should be speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index of glass. So this is wrong because this should be divided. Okay, then the incident angle of a light ray at an air glass surface is the angle between the ray and the glass surface. Um, no, the incident angle is the angle between the ray and the normal line, which is perpendicular to the glass surface. If this is the glass surface, this is the normal line, this is the incident ray, it's the angle over here between the incident ray and the normal, and not between the glass surface and the incident angle. The sine of the critical angle, which is sine c, at an air glass surface is equal to 1 divided by refractive index of glass. Yes, this is correct. This is the exact formula. And then lastly, the angle of refraction for light passing through an air glass surface is proportional to the angle of incidence at that surface. No, they're not proportional, that's why there's such thing called refractive index of glass. So, nope. The answer is C. Question 23. Which statement about converging lenses is correct? They're the ones that look like this. A real image of an object projected onto a screen by a converging lens is always inverted. Yeah, this is correct. We're lucky. But still, let's go through the other options. The image formed by a converging lens is always upright. No, we just said that it's inverted, so obviously this is not the answer. The image formed by a converging lens when used as a magnifying glass is a real image. Nope, it's a virtual image. Parallel rays entering a converging lens are focused at a distance greater than the focal length from the lens. This is also not the correct answer. They are focused at a distance shorter than the focal length, so let's say this is the lens and this is the focal length, then the parallel rays entering should be somewhere over here between the focal length and the converging lens itself. So nope, our answer is A. Question 24. An intruder alarm sensor detects that a person is warmer than his surroundings. Which type of electromagnetic wave does the sensor detect? It's by detecting the change in temperature. They're all infrared radiation emitted by a person and the surroundings. So yeah, it's A. Question 25. Two people are standing outdoors on either side of a high wall. Person 1 can hear person 2 talking as though he cannot see her. Yeah, if this person talks, somehow person 2 can hear it. Which statement explains this? The sound waves have diffracted around the wall. Yeah, this is actually correct. So even if it hits like this, it's going to be diffracted and somehow reach the person too. For B, the sound waves have passed unaffected through the wall. Okay, obviously the sound waves are not going to go through the wall. That doesn't make sense. It's not magic. So no, the sound waves have reflected around the wall. If it reflects, it means that it's going back to this person. So the person too will not be able to hear the sound. The sound waves have refracted around the wall. Um, no, for this, we specifically use the word diffraction instead of refraction. So it's A. 
Question 26. Four nails A, B, C, and D are tested to find which makes the strongest permanent magnet. One of the nails is placed against the bar magnet and the number of paper clips which the nail can support is recorded. There are two paper clips attached to it through the nail to the bar magnet. The bar magnet is then removed and the number of paper clips remaining attached to the nail is recorded. Each nail is tested individually. Which nail becomes the strongest permanent magnet? Alright, so the concept is that you put the nail to the bar magnet and you try to make this nail a strong permanent magnet. And we test this by putting paper clips. The more paper clips that can be attached to the nail, the stronger the nail is. Okay, so first, when the bar magnet was present, there were two. And then when they removed it, there were only zero. So you can see that 0% of the nails were remaining. The next, when they put two, it became one. So this is 50% remaining. Then from four to three. So even when they removed the bar magnet, there were still three of them left. And this is 75% remaining. So the highest so far. And then you put five and two remained. This is 40% remaining. So we can say that the third one, since 75% of the nails have still been attracted to the nail, even when the bar magnet was removed, it's the strongest one. Question 27. The diagram show a magnetized steel rod inside a solenoid connected to a potential meter. In diagram 1, the potential meter is connected to a DC power supply. In diagram 2, it's an AC power supply. Alright, then which action would demagnetize the piece of steel? Oh, there is a way of demagnetizing the piece of steel using an AC power supply, but you cannot do that using a DC power supply. So for this, the diagram 1 just doesn't work at all. And our options A and B are just out because we always need to use the AC supply. Then what we do is we need to decrease the current while the AC current is running. So to decrease the current, since this is a potential meter here, you have to move this guy over here so that when the current flows, it will flow from like this until here. It will have the least current. So our answer will be that in diagram 2, you move the potential meter slide from S to R so that you can decrease the current while the AC current is running. Question 28. The diagram shows a positively charged conducting sphere and a wire connected to Earth. What happens when the wire is touched onto the sphere? So since this is the Earth, it's going to remove the charges on the sphere, which is currently positive. While the positively charged ones do not go back to the Earth, instead, the negative ions, which are basically the electrons, will move into the sphere. And that's how you make it in a neutral state and Earth it. Therefore, from our options, the answer is that the electrons flow from Earth to the sphere. Question 29. A student uses the circuit shown to determine the resistance of two identical resistors. The voltmeter reading is 2.2 volts and the ammeter reading is 0.25 amperes. What is the resistance? Resistance equals to voltage divided by current. Let's first calculate the resistance. That is 2.2 divided by 0.25. It's 8.8 .8 ohms. But don't stop here. It's not the end. You need to remember that there are two resistors. Well, since these are in series, the resistance just adds up. So, in fact, there will be 4.4 ohms here and 4.4 ohms here. And they ask for the resistance of each resistor. So our answer is C. Question 30. There is a current of 2 amperes in a resistor of resistance 8 ohms. How much power is dissipated in the resistor? Power equals 2 voltage times the current, which is also square of current times the resistance. So just do your calculations. 2 squared times 8 equals 2, 32 watts. D. Question 31. The lamps, the diodes, and the batteries in the circuits are identical. 
And which circuit does the ammeter give the greatest reading? So basically, which circuit has the highest current? For A, it will travel like this, and you'll be able to go through this diode it's in the right direction and go back, and another line. So let's say it started with 10 amperes of current, and it divides to maybe 8 amperes and 2 amperes. They will all just still come back as 10 amperes in the end because they all manage to pass through. Okay, but for B, current will flow in this way, but uh-oh, the diode is in the wrong direction. So we won't be able to go pass through this side of the circuit, but it will still be able to go through this and go back like this. So let's say again, this was 10 amperes. The 8 amperes wasn't able to pass through, but 2 amperes was. But in the end, it's just 2 amperes. For C, it will go in this way. Okay, this is okay. But then as you go here, the diode is in the wrong direction. You cannot pass this again. So in the end, you start with 10 and then you'll only have 8 amperes left. Okay, I'm not saying that it's exactly 10 amperes and 8 amperes. I'm just giving you rough numbers. The important thing is that only a part of the current will flow back to the circuit and the overall current will be decreased because of the diode placed in wrong direction. Last one. Uh-oh, it's just blocked straight away. There's probably no current here, so obviously this is not the answer. And the circuit with the greatest reading on the ammeter will be A, which has all the diodes in the correct direction. This is the correct way of the diode, by the way. It flows in this direction. And it cannot flow in an opposite direction, so you have to be careful when you're drawing your circuit diagrams as well. Question 32. Two resistors are connected in series with a power supply. Which statement about the circuit is correct? The current from the supply is greater than the current in each resistor. Um, no. Well, if you think of the resistors connected in series, you know that if this is 2 ohms and 3 ohms, they just add up to become 5 ohms. So initially, if it was 5 ohms here, they were divided. So the current from the supply will be the same or equal to the sum of the currents in each resistor. So if you go through this, it's not greater. Equal to the current in each resistor, we'll know it's the sum less is no and yet we have d where the current from the supply is the sum of the currents in each resistor question 33 which two logic gates each have a high output when both of their inputs are high high output is basically one and inputs are high when both of the inputs are one and one well for this and gate will work because it requires both the inputs to be high to have a high output and OR gate will work as well because for this, it can either be 1, 0 or 1, 1 to have 1 as its output. So the answer is A. Question 34. The diagram shows a series of logic gates and part of its corresponding truth table. Alright, we need to find these values. It's easier if we write this down on the diagram itself. If it starts at 0 and 1, okay, this is an AND gate. Therefore, your output will be 0, and this is 0, 1 again, and OR gate is here, so the output will be 1. And then this is an AND gate, which is the opposite of an AND gate, so the output will be 1. And we've got our answer, it's 0, 1, 1. The answer is B. Question 35. The graph show how the currents in three circuits vary with time. In which circuit is there a direct current? A direct current is something that has positive value for its current. So the shape doesn't really matter. Well, circuit 1, yeah, the graph stays above the 0.0, .0 line. So it is a DC circuit. But for circuit 2, it has went past the 0, 0.0 line. There are negative values, so this is an AC circuit, so no. And circuit 3, it's very constant, just positive 1.0, so it's also a DC circuit. The answer is B. 
Question 36. The coil of a simple AC generator rotates steadily in a uniform magnetic field. The diagram shows the position of the coil at time t equals to zero, which graph shows the output voltage for one revolution of the coil. Firstly, this will start from zero volts, and it will have both positive and negative values because the direction changes. Therefore, it's a which starts at zero, not B because it starts at somewhere else and has both positive and negative values. Question 37. What occurs during nuclear fusion? Now there's something called nuclear fusion. Don't get confused. This is fusion. So nuclear fusion is two light atomic nuclei join together and emit energy or absorb energy. You can get confused. So make sure you memorize the definition properly. It's A, where they join together and emit energy. For nuclear fusion, it's when they split up and absorb energy. Question 38. A radioactive material has a half-life of 20 days. A sample of the material contains 8.0 times 10 to the power of 10 atoms. How many atomic nuclei have decayed after 60 days? So 20 days, another 20 days, and another 20 days makes it 60 days. So you can see that you went through three half-lives. First, you had 8.0 times 10 to the power of 10. Then after 20 days, you will have 4.0 times 10 to the power of 10. Then 2.0 times 10 to the power of 10. Then 1.0 times 10 to the power of 10. This is all you're left with. And they asked how many have decayed after 60 days. They didn't ask you how much you're left with. So since you first had 8.0 times 10 to the power of 10, if you minus this, you have 7.0 times 10 to the power of 10 decayed after 60 days. Question 39. A thin sheet of paper is placed between a radioactive source and a radiation detector. The count rate falls to a very low reading. Okay, you just put a paper and then it already starts dropping. From this result, which type of radiation is the source emitting? If it's beta particles, gamma rays, or x-rays, even if you put a paper in it, the readings won't decrease. They are not blocked by a paper. But for alpha particles, yeah, they are blocked by a thin sheet of paper. So from this, you can know that the source is emitting alpha particles. Question 40. Alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays are emitted by a radioactive nuclei when they decay. Which emissions can be deflected by an electric field? It's the ones that have charges, positive for alpha particles, negative for beta particles, but none for gamma rays. Therefore, only alpha particles and beta particles can be deflected by an electric field. I really hope this video has helped you guys to do better in physics. If it did, please like and leave a comment. I would appreciate them so much. Thank you for watching. Stay safe. God bless you guys. Bye.